The reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him, and he could not pay. His lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him, and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. When Then he went out and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. <coughs> So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Loving God, grant us the gift of your spirit, that our minds may be illumined to understand your word, and our hearts and wills strengthened to follow it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, one of my favorite writers is a woman called Anne Lamont. And I suppose the one, one of the reasons that I like her is that she is, uh, how shall I say, unusually, perhaps sometimes brutally honest about life. In a recent book, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, she writes with bold honesty about her struggle to forgive her mother. And she says, I prayed for my heart to soften but my heart remained hardened toward her. I refused to be nice to her, and I didn't forgive her for being a terrified, furious, clinging, sucking maw of need and arrogance. Even after Lamont takes the first steps toward forgiving her mother, mother she struggles. She says, I discovered that I had forgiven her a number of things, although not for any of the big ticket items, like having existed at all, for instance, and then for having lived so long. But she concludes, still, the mosaic chips of forgiveness I felt that day were to start. Forgiveness is not easy. Our parable for this morning from the 18th chapter of Matthew is rather, well, rather more ambitious than some other parables. It teaches and encourages us to be sure. But the parable of the unforgiving steward is rather, rather like a baited trap. It's designed to get our sympathy, you know, draw you in, get you to take sides, even be outraged. Throw up your hands. You want to say out loud, what is wrong with that guy? How can someone, forgiven, be so darn petty? It's around that point that the trap springs. <laughs> We're caught. The story's about us. <laughs> we, we can be like that. C.S. Lewis once said, Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. <laughs> Our parable for this morning comes out of a conversation that Jesus has with Peter. 
that Jesus is sort of offering in the 18th chapter of Matthew a short course on conflict management and public relations in church. When someone sins against you, he tells his followers, don't let it fester, don't, don't let it uh, spread in your soul like cancer. Go and get it right. Be, be reconciled. After all, if the same divisions are found in church as in the local garden club, well, what sort of credibility are we going to have? If the church is just as full of party spirit and bickering and envy as any other human gathering, why would anybody feel any attraction? You can get that anywhere. But no, go and get it right, says Jesus. Uh, and if you need to, get other people in the church to help you get it right. We're, we're the light of the world. In our life together as church, the world ought to be able to see something of God's kingdom breaking in. We, we have got to forgive, Jesus says. And then, and then he tells a story. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to. Uh, thus begins the longer part of Jesus' answer to Peter's shorter question. And with this answer, the whole question is reconfigured. Where God reigns unhindered, where people are converted, shaped, formed by the good news of Jesus Christ, it hears how forgiveness ought to look. There was a man who owned a king, owed a king, 10,000 talents. Now it's important to understand that 10,000 talents is too much debt for anybody to ever repay in a lifetime. The entire budget in Jesus' day for the province of Galilee was 300 talents. The entire budget for the province of Judea was 600 talents. 10,000 talents uh, represents the day wages of a day laborer for 150,000 years. Now, there, there's simply no way of measuring the debt that this guy is in. He's sunk. I mean, he's a dead duck. It's over. I mean, you would have to be one reckless scoundrel to get yourself in this kind of debt to begin with. His wife and family are now jeopardized uh, to being sold into slavery. All of his assets are liquidated. Uh, this is a bankruptcy. We'll recover what we can. Uh, that's why when you see him groveling and posturing, I mean, this is practiced for him. Stammering out excuses he's probably used before. He says, Lord, Lord have patience with me and I'll repay you everything. I don't think so. I mean, it's impossible. He knows it. He, he's a weasel. <laughs> the king knows it. A restorative justice is, it, what, is what he asks for, but he can never hope to restore. The ledger sheet approach to life, well, that's all he knows. I, I'll make it right. I'll pay back every red cent fine rhetoric. But restorative justice won't work in this case. Neither he nor the king will live long enough. He's posturing, he's, he's lying, he's dissembling. He would be lucky to make the interest payments on what he owes. He's a hopeless case. He's completely at the king's mercy. The truth is on the table. The honors have it. Everybody knows he's in trouble. And the mercy he asks for, he gets. The king, the king is merciful. He doesn't feel anger, he feels compassion for this guy groveling on the ground. A genuine wrong has been committed, everybody knows it. A debt stands in front of them in full relief, but the king relieves the servant of a debt he could never pay. Life begins again. Uh, he doesn't have to walk on the other sidewalk, hide himself from public life anymore. He receives a gift beyond, beyond telling. The ledger is closed and discarded. Jesus is saying that that's, that's what God's like. Peter, forget your measured mercy. God forgives with limitless grace. <clears throat> so must you. I mean, this is a word for all of us disciples. Before any of us tackles the question of forgiving somebody else, we begin with the recognition that we are forgiven by a merciful God. That is the truth about us. But that same servant 
he went out and came upon one of his fellow servants. So on the way out of his encounter with the king, shirt still sweat, soaked, face covered with bits of gravel from groveling there on the ground, he meets a fellow servant. I mean, this guy has got to be dying to tell somebody about what's happened to him. He must be secretly hoping this guy's going to say, well, what happened to you? Uh, I, I bet whether or not he asked, this guy is just, he's got a story so great, you've got to tell somebody, right? Introvert or not, I mean, Presbyterian or Pentecostal, he must be busting to bear witness to his salvation. Uh, I've been forgiven, I almost met with total disaster. Do you know how close I was to being just sold into slavery? Do you know how much I've been forgiven? 10,000 talents, that's like a, a billion dollars. I, I've got my life back, my family, my children, my future. Hallelujah, I'm free. But we should have picked up the clues about what kind of man we're dealing with. Did you notice that after he's forgiven, there's like nothing on thank you. <laughs> nothing at all, not a word of gratitude. Gestures of devotion are missing, no parties held, no dancing or merriment in this man's life. Just saved from the gallows. Doesn't embrace his wife and children whom he almost lost to slavery forever. I mean, what is missing from this picture? In a word, I think it's gratitude. All of our expectations of a man forgiven, well, they're just blown away. This fellow servant gets no good news from the forgiven servant. Instead, what he gets is seized by the neck, by the throat. The reason at that, a trifling debt at that. Uh, the other servant actually only owes him one day's wage. It's enough to make you throw up your hands. What, what is wrong with this man? How can anybody forgive him? As much as him be so darn petty, how can a man who has known compassion and mercy and tender-heartedness be so hard-hearted himself? And, and do you notice the story that, he, that the fellow servant gives to him? He says, uh, he makes the same request of the unforgiving guy as he made to the king, right? It's the same speech, only this time it's a speech that's actually believable. The fellow servant could repay this debt, but the forgiven man refuses to forgive. He will not have patience. He will not show mercy. He will not forgive. He out and out refuses. Here is a thankless, pitiful, miserly little fellow who must be using every bit of his cold-hearted resolve to be so rotten in the face of grace. The grace of forgiveness does not make him grateful enough to forgive. And there's something wrong. There's something horribly wrong with that picture. Even his fellow servants standing around there, they know something's wrong with this. If, if, the, forgive, if the king forgave a great debt, then we can hardly make pitch stands over small sums. That's the common sense that sort of settled into the group who watched forgiveness unfold. They are, says Matthew, greatly distressed by their unforgiving co-workers. Now, when word gets back to the king that the one forgiven a great amount will not forgive a little amount, the king throws this guy into prison until he pays all of his debt, which means, like, forever. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt, uh, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. I mean, Jesus' reasoning for the church is pretty straightforward. He utters a warning here for everyone who would receive God's mercy and not be merciful. To those who record wrongs suffered as accounts receivable while accepting forgiveness for the wrongs they have done, this king says there's no cheap grace. Forgiveness, a gift, given and received from God, should shape our life together as God's people in this place and in the wider world. If you want to live by the tally sheet, remember that is a two-edged sword. 
So before we decide how many times we will forgive, uh, we might want to ask ourselves how many times do you want to be forgiven? Years ago, James, James Oglethorpe, governor of Georgia, was walking with John Wesley, you know, the evangelist. Oglethorpe said to Wesley in a proud moment, you know, I never forgive, Reverend. Wesley looked at him and said, then, then I hope you never sin. <laughs> to lay a claim to forgiveness without extending it to others simply shows that we neither understand nor deeply experience God's forgiveness of us. Rather, we patch together some kind of theory which justifies our own failures while condemning everybody else. Uh, do you know the story about the priest who comes to the pulpit microphone every Sunday and says, the Lord be with you, and the people say, and also with you? Well, one Sunday he says, the Lord be with you, and then notices the microphone isn't working, and he says, there must be something wrong with this microphone, and the congregation responds, and also with you. <laughs> uh, friends, uh, forgiveness makes no sense until we recognize that there's something wrong with me. As long as it's always somebody else who has offended me, who owes me, who hurt me, uh, we can get hardened in our opinions by rehearsing those stories until they become the stories of our life. I think that's the point that Jesus was making to Peter. Forgiveness only makes sense when you realize the cost of your own forgiveness, and it's more than you could ever pay. The New Testament reinforces this point time and time again. Be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and if you have a complaint against another, forgive each other just as you have been forgiven and we confess when we say it in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. It seems that it takes a lot of reminding to get this one right. Friends, if our greatest need was ignorance, God would have sent us an educator. If what would really shape us up was technology, God would have sent us a scientific genius. If what it took to have life to the fullest was money, God would have sent us an economist. If people were made for pleasure alone, God would have come amongst us as an entertainer. But our greatest need the one thing we cannot live without is forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. When you struggle to forgive, remember that. Amen. Let's pray. Merciful God, you have commanded us to imitate your goodness in our lives. By the power of your Holy Spirit, turn us from evil to good. Help us to forgive each other and keep us in your ways of righteousness and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.